Hello, everybody. It's me again. Uh, so we'll have a panel about open data, open APIs. And because of the talk before, uh, I will also propose that we talk about open hardware, right? So we will talk about openness. And uh, we'll talk about openness on three main ideas, right? The first is, yeah, what is open, right? What is open and uh, what does that imply in, in the technology sense, right? Uh, open data, open APIs, what, what's open hardware? What's the difference, right? Then we will talk about like a business implications, right? Uh, about monetization, about power. Uh, and then the last part, we will talk about sovereignty, right? Regulation, we'll talk about how to take governments are implied into open data, open APIs, and open hardware. Right, so that will be the three topics, and for that I will ask you please to uh, welcome the, the three uh, participants to that panel. So, so the first one is Ken Lane, right, the API evangelist, right. Uh, he has been former uh, in innovation fellow under Barack Obama's presidency. So please, we can applause Ken. Thank you. The second panelist that we will uh, receive uh, is uh, uh, Isabel, right? Isabel Reusa. Uh, she has, yeah, you can applause her, yeah. So Isabel has been working hard uh, opening APIs for uh, national French museums, right? And she will tell us a little bit more about it. And the last one is uh, Tin, so you had him on stage, but you could, we can applause him again. Yeah, yeah, you can. I love this jingle. Uh, so we'll have time for questions, but again, if you have any, it's, it's a panel, but it's also a discussion. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and someone will uh, bring a mic to you, right? So thank you, Kin. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Tin. Right, uh, to to be here. So my first question is that uh, uh, maybe for you, Isabel. Right. Uh, so you work you work with museums, right? So what's for you the difference between open data and open APIs? Uh, open data is a very political part, and open APIs are more of a tool. Uh, open data is a tool to uh, distribute uh, cultural content. If we are talking about culture. And uh, open data is a very uh, vast subject, especially in culture, as pretty much everybody agrees on what data is. And in the cultural sector, it would be, you know, mostly metadata. You know, I've got a work of art or, um, I don't know, a, a, a theater play or something. And, you know, I'll have information about who wrote it or who uh, painted it and that type of information. But then there's also a big uh, deal, especially in France, about you know, if I've got the image of an artwork, is the image data or is it a content? So you know, this is a very vast subject, which is really, really far from being dealt with at the moment. So there are great expectations about this, and it's uh, quite complicated, and not everybody agrees, even at the government level, on what you have to open, what you, know, you don't have to open, what, uh, you know, some business models might be uh, endangered if you open everything for free as open data. So it's a very, very vast subject. And you can maybe, what's your, your vision uh, about, like, that question? Yeah, uh, I agree. Data is very political. Um, and, and API access being, I would say, more technical, but actually what you provide access to via the API is much harder than the API itself. And I tend to use the term public data when I'm uh, to try to shift the political landscape, I guess, a little bit. Uh, open is hard because a lot of people uh, interpret open in many different ways. Um, but even with public data, there's also a lot of, uh, a lot of beliefs. Thank you. Uh, a, lot, a lot of beliefs around uh, what should be open and what should not be open. So uh, a lot of people think that public data by default should be open and available for free always on the web. And whether that's because it's public data, meaning government owned, or it's public because it's on the web, sometimes because just because it's on the web, people feel like, oh, it should be free. And so when that's government or uh, government funded entities putting data on the, on the web, 
There's a lot of a uh, lot of beliefs that this should be uh, free. So open, public, free. Yeah, three different meanings, right? So TIN in uh, open motors, right? So the previous name was OS vehicle, like open source vehicles. Now it's open motors. So you have open in your title, right? Uh, for you, how did you decide what should be open and what should not be open in, uh, in, in your company and in motors? Yeah, th this is a very delicate uh, topic. Uh, because actually, um, what we are doing is basically trying to make the perfect car for big cities. And we have to be very aware of the different policies of uh, each country, you know. And um, in this case, um, let's say for, from our side, we are trying to convince, uh, to convince tier one suppliers to be more open, okay to provide more documentation, APIs, okay? To basically, as I was saying before, to reduce the reverse engineering close to zero, okay? So to save time in the R&D and develop faster. Regarding data and policies, uh, this is a very delicate subject because uh, there are countries like China or South Korea, they don't like to, they don't like the Google approach let's say, of owning, uh, getting all the data, okay? So in this case, we really need to think about uh, a very modular approach, uh, very modular, let's say. Let's talk about granularity on ownership and, uh, and also policies on data and AI. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, let's say that um, we are not in, uh, in the 2000 anymore, so the approach of Google is not working in these countries. And there are, if, they, if companies are not considering this, and this is something that I also pointed out at the Tokyo Motor Show, if tier one suppliers, auto OEMs, they don't uh, understand this part, they're gonna lose big chunk of markets like China, South Korea, and other countries. Yeah. So in this case, uh, the, the answer is maximum flex, flexibility and extreme modularity. On, yeah. So, um, Ken, you were saying that the, the free, the open, the public discussion was happening. You, Isabel, at the French National Museums, maybe you can tell also what you did. Uh, but, uh, yeah, how this discussion, like free, open, public, uh, how this discussion uh, went? Uh, the discussion uh, was quite uh, difficult and it lasted for a few years and I would say it's still not finished. And they, So I used to work for a company called the Réunion des Musées Nationaux, which is a public authority that is an operator basically that operates services for museums. One of them is digitizing works of art, so it's basically taking pictures uh, of works of art. Now it's, uh, the RMN is going into 3D uh, captures of uh, sculptures and stuff. And, um, and one of its activities is to sell pictures, those pictures, like you know, any uh, photo agency would do. And uh, the uh, money that is uh, coming from these uh, sales of uh, artwork images goes back partly to the operator, but partly also to these museums. So you know, there's a business model that's been you know, on for decades, and that was more or less working. And the, the project came from you know, the fact that there was this movement towards uh, open content. And so there was a question and also uh, the RMA needed to better uh, address its public you know, more widely and say that those images should be made available more widely. So you know, the project started. And we realized uh, doing this that there was uh, a lot of fear that the business model would be destroyed if we so we started, sorry, building an API to distribute it better, first to ourselves and the museums, but also to any business partner or to any uh, uh, educational uh, project or whatever. So the, the rules, uh, the uh, general rules uh, of the APIs were quite simple. It was for any non-commercial project, you could get the images for free, and for any commercial project, you know, you, it would still, uh, you would still have to pay for them. So uh, this was obviously seen by a large part of the community as 
uh, extremely uh, not innovative because they thought you know, that these images for, should be absolutely available for free, which some museums were doing, like the Rake Museum in Amsterdam or some museum in the US. Uh, the uh, the uh, example of the images of the NASA in the United States that are uh, available for free for all use, uh, you know, was uh, very uh, often given. Uh, so, you know, it was, to me, a, a step towards opening up the, co the contents. Uh, so to some people, it was uh, viewed as uh, going too far and destroying a business model. And to some people, it was seen as, you know, almost doing it nothing because it was still not open data. So, and even, I was saying earlier that the metadata were, were not too much of a problem. Well, actually it was, because even on the status of the metadata, there was still no agreement. And more importantly, uh, the government, which, uh, you know, we, uh, the RMN is a public authority, so, you know, asked several times, you know, to the government, you know, what, the, what was the policy and what the RMN should be doing. And the government was not really deciding. So, basically, we just moved forward and thinking, you know, we are opening up, you know, when nothing is stopping us, we'll, you know, we'll open up. But, uh, so we went you know, to that point at the time. I think that the RMN is still thinking of opening up the, the uses even more uh, and also putting better definition because the API only uh, distributes, you know, low definition images because, you know, this in, uh, internally was a very highly political and business subject. So you can, since 2009, you've seen many waves into the open data, open APIs, and we had a discussion about monetization also. Uh, with a, uh, so can you tell, tell us a little bit more about uh, what you were saying yesterday about it? Sure. So in the United States, there was a, a kind of a 2008, 2009, 10, there was a big popular movement. And I think it influenced decisions over here as well or set the kind of tone. It was based upon, you know, public government agencies should make data freely available on the web and for use for any purpose, whether that's commercial or not. So you can build startups and everyone just said, you know, make it open, make it open. And I was part of that wave of people who went to cities and said, you know, transit, uh, bus systems, all, you know, cities should be making this data open. And then we went to the federal government in the United States, Washington, D.C., and did the same. And I was part of, I ended up getting invited to the White House and worked in 2013 for President Obama going around to federal agencies and working with them to open up their public data inventory assets. So you can still go to federal agencies uh, like healthandhumanservices.gov slash data.json and it's a, a data inventory of everything they had. And that was my work. But what I saw over the last four or five years of watching that work is that companies, tech companies tend to extract all the value. And if I ever said, hey, you should put an API up, a lot of people really kind of resisted. And, and every time I write a post about, hey, uh, that government agency, rather than just that free download or that open API, should actually require people sign up for key and ask them what they're doing so you can understand what they're building. I get a lot of hate email and a lot of hate tweets. People saying, no, it should be free and open. And I said, well, you know that agency like doesn't have the money to keep this going and you're extracting all the value here. And, and, and when you look at like transit agencies in the US, Google is extracting all the value from these transit agencies and putting it into Google Maps and generating ad revenue. And these agencies are, are barely operating, many of them in the United States. And so I took this idea of API management and, and starting to charge for commercial access to data around government. And you can see some discussions. I still get a lot of pushback, but one of the, the, the agencies that moved forward was the Department of Interior in the United States, which runs all the national parks is one of the things they do. So Grand Canyon, all of the different parks. And there's actual talk amongst the Forest Service and national parks that we should actually charge for access for this data. So they have a, an API that I helped build called the Recreational Information Database, RIDB. And it's, an, it's all the trails and parks and campgrounds and everything about the national park systems. And it's freely available. You can download the whole database. You can get at the API, and they're talking about putting an API management layer. And again, we had people say, no, this is our park system. It should be free and open. And I said, well, 
can you go set up a business at the Grand Canyon? Can you just go into the Grand Canyon and set up a hot dog stand and start selling hot dogs? Well, no. Uh, we have to pay fees to do that, and we have to give a piece of our revenue to the government if we want to sell hot dogs at the Grand Canyon. So why is it different with digital data? Why should Google be able to extract all the value from this data and be able to use it in Google Maps? And so people are starting to think about it, and, but they're like, well, it's different. It's physical or it's virtual. And I was all, well, it's kind of bridging the both of the worlds. It's, you know, there's some uh, finite resources on the national parks, water, air, gas, that may seemingly be uh, endless. And we charge companies or we don't extract that value. We just leave it in the parks. So why should the digital data be any different? And so we're starting to have these conversations with some agencies, but it's still a very political issue. Maybe one quick question on, on this to, to Isabel again. But so in France, you know, museums are free one day a month, right? The first Sunday? Yes. Kind of. So do you imagine an Not EP all of them. Not the all national them. ones. The national yeah. ones. Do you imagine, uh, can you imagine an API free just for one that day would be, a month? Oh, that's an idea. <laughs> Actually, that's a good subject. Because just for people to feel it, right? But you know, you started as a joke, but what's interesting with APIs, and they are, in that sense, very rich, and they can bring an interesting layer to open data, is that APIs allow rich model, uh, business models. You can say, you know, access to all the data is absolutely free, unless you need more. If you need to, uh, you know, uh, access the API like a million times a day, maybe you are going to start to pay. If you want to access uh, maybe uh, richer data, richer metadata or added value services, such as, I don't know, maybe a very rich search engine, you know, you can maybe start uh, building, um, you know, paying services on top of a free layer. And APIs, uh, APIs allow that. And I think that might be an interesting step for anyone who uh, needs to open up data, but who still, you know, has a business model to, to uh, protect. So we talk about governments and public authorities. So you, Tin, you work with the industry, like, directly, right? You can, you work also with industries sometimes, right? But uh, uh, in your... Uh, every day's work, you work with the, the car industry, manufacturing industry. They are known to be really secret. They don't share a lot of stuff, right? They have a high, tight contract with their suppliers. So how do you discuss about openness uh, with them? Like, what's, what's the level of discussion, right? What, what could you take from them or, and ask them to open to, to the public? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, as I was saying, a very tough discussion with them. <laughs> Uh, especially with auto OEMs, they are, you know, the traditional automotive industry, it's all about doing everything in secret and then release it in a, in a big event and then start selling and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think this is a very old-fashioned approach and we're trying to do, to do it completely different. Um, it's not easy because um, for them, this approach uh, basically is the only approach available for this industry. They did this since forever, and uh, they are not willing to change their mindset easily. Let's say. Mm. But uh, that's why we are, uh, let's say, working uh, tr more with uh, tier one suppliers in this case. Um, they love us because our objective is to put uh, different type of cars in the market and make people use it more and more. So in this case, uh, for them, first, is interesting in terms of financial. Okay, so let's say that uh, there's a battery company. Uh, if we use a lot of batteries, they have to source batteries, so they are selling, selling, and selling. So super interesting for them. The other aspect is try to convince them also to have a more open approach on the specification, on the, on the documentation of uh, this every single part, so companies can develop faster, okay? And let's say it's easier, this part. Um, the other interesting part is related to data. And obviously, each company has their own policy on it. They are very interested to, to collect data. 
okay? And we, we are here also to uh, facilitate this, okay? So the objective is uh, avoid to have a shitty technology in, uh, in uh, the cars that we are driving every day because actually the power that we have in our pocket, like a smartphone, uh, the device is way better, has a better uh, um, navigation system, connectivity, screen, whatever, than the latest uh, infotainment system of a lux luxurious car. Okay? And also, this is a weird approach of technology because they are locking everything in, in the vehicle, and you have to keep this vehicle theoretically for some years. So you have an outdated system that you have to bring with you for many years. So anyway, for uh, the modular approach that we have is completely different. So we can replace parts. And the most interesting thing is that we can put in the market faster in, uh, in, a, in a more controlled environment in a way because we can co collect a lot of data. This data is very valuable for the manufacturers of these sensors, products, and everything. So they can uh, understand, uh, the, they can get real feedbacks, real data from uh, real applications, okay, instead of having just in a lab. And in this case, we are also helping uh, auto OEMs, so big car companies, to get the technology faster because uh, we put it in a smaller environment, let's say, so small deployment. And collecting da data, they can do iteration. We can replace the parts easily, okay? So we do multiple iteration to optimize the product. And then an auto OEM says, okay, this technology is cool, and now I can put it in my millions of cars. Yeah. So this is what we are trying to involve. In so did, did the Tesla's movement to open uh, patents also showed to suppliers uh, that, okay, this is the new movement, right? And if you, if you can beat them, join them, and then like open motors, like you are totally in this, in this movement? Yeah, yeah, we are like this since day one. Uh, being part of Y Combinator, for example, the president, uh, Sam Alman, is working side by side with Elon Musk on open AI, okay? They're trying to avoid AI killing all, all of us, okay? <laughs> which is important. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, Tesla, they, they, they announced this. They, let's say that uh, they haven't really uh, released everything. Okay? We are waiting for it. Yeah. And, uh, but they have to solve some other problems now more related to massive manufacturing in their gigafactories. And, uh, yeah. But... Anyway, we think that um, technology is going that fast that um, some of the Tesla technology already is kind of, uh, let's say, old. And we want to introduce faster other technologies that should be, that can be better. And uh, yeah, with this approach. Yeah. Yeah. So just for the reminder, y, y Combinator is a, is a, a Silicon Valley accelerator Right, funded by someone called Paul Graham, and company like Airbnb, Dropbox, Docker, uh, Stripe, and all these companies went through this incubator. Right, so it's a top-notch incubator in the Silicon Valley. Right, just just for uh, general knowledge. Uh, okay, so I understand industry. So they will open unless they have direct industry benefits. Right, they will not open for exactly. something else. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, follow the money. Right. Yeah, for them, if this approach brings them value. Okay, value could be money, could be data. Okay, so we're trying to combine both and uh, also to make this, uh, let's say, information available to more people, developers, to, so they can iterate and develop and deploy, yeah, innovate. Yeah, so on the, um, we'll talk a little bit about regulation now uh, because companies open APIs or uh, maybe open to make better business. But now some governments or uh, regulation environments oblige companies to open APIs. So we have PSD2 in Europe, right? You were making a talk about that, right? In France, we have this open data regulation that say every city should open data. Whatever PDF, 
CSV, Excel, or whatever. Uh, so, so yeah, what's the what's the U.S. environment on this? Where are you on the regulation to open data APIs, or whatever? Yeah, in the U.S., I mean, there's not a positive view of what is regulation, despite it being uh, regulations driving many industries. I would say there's you know many subsidies that drive agriculture and uh, and other, uh, but still in large in the U.S. regulations is a bad word. So it's not seen as something that's going to help anything. The more regulations you have, the, the more harm it does to businesses. Uh, so there's, but there's uh, a lot of people waking up to the fact that data is valuable right now, and that's where the value is made. And so this is, uh, what I'm trying to do is show cities, show uh, federal agencies that, hey, you have a lot of data that's being extracted that is extremely valuable and you ha you're having a hard time with your budgets. So not only should you be uh, taking control of your own data, you should also be uh, protecting your uh, citizens and your constituents and helping them maintain the value and importance of their data. And we've had some pretty high profile breaches uh, in the United States. Uh, the credit system was breached. Uh, 230 million people's data were, was, was leaked. And so that kind of showed, pulled back the curtain about how valuable the data uh, brokering system is in the United States. And so there's some discussion in, in Congress and in, uh, in our government about what to do about this. Um, unfortunately, we have an administration right now that's not going to be very progressive and, uh, and forward thinking when it comes to regulations and data. But at the city level, there's a, a lot of discussion around the value of data and how we can regulate uh, not only the, the access of the data, how it can be used and how it should be used and it should be more transparent and observable. The New York City is starting to understand that, that the value of the, the city data, mapping data, transit data, but then also the value of this in algorithms and they're passing laws to regulate how data and how city, if city data or city money is being used to generate algorithms that is used to impact society in any way those have to be open source and those have to be openly available so that we can look at them because not only the city data is being used to generate these algorithms, but these algorithms are deciding who goes to jail and who doesn't go to jail in the U.S. court systems. It, de it de decides who, uh, what schools you go to in the, in the U.S., which uh, uh, child uh, custody services, whether you stay with your parents or not. Uh, there's a lot of algorithmic decisions being made and data is key to this. So uh, cities are waking up. The federal government is taking about 20 steps back right now, unfortunately. Will we be judged by an algorithm soon? Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah, I mean, right now there's some, some pretty big cases in the U.S. about uh, algorithmic observability and transparency at, in, the, in the court system and so. deciding our, you know, who, how we will be judged. And the policing system, uh, policing... Uh, system, uh, they're making a lot of decisions about where they send police out in different cities based upon data. And then uh, police departments are having problems with their data. The, the New York uh, uh, Police Department is in a court, system, a court battle with uh, Palantir Technologies, which is Peter Thiel, who is PayPal, um, Facebook, a bunch of others. His company, Palantir, sold the New York Police Department a surveillance system to surveil, surveil the population. It, they connected it to their data. It sucked in all the police department's data. It never quite delivered what they promised. And the, the NYPD said, all right, give us our data back so we can just do our old way. And Palantir said, nope, it's our data now. And so they're in court right now. Yeah, all your data are belongs to us. Yes. Ha, ha, ha. No, for, the one, <laughs> for the one who know the, the meme. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in France we used to say there are, there are two kinds of lawyers, right? The lawyers who, lawyers who know the law and lawyers who know the judge, right? But there's maybe a third kind of lawyer, lawyers who know the code, right? Behind the algorithm, right? Yeah. So just, just for thinking. Uh, so you, Isabel, in, with the national museums, did the regulation made an impact? Or no, it was like driven by public good or, for, or maybe uh, sustainable business models? Again, it should be simple, and it's complicated. <laughs> if I go back to the example of national museums, which again is like 
you know, some museums in France, because most museums belong uh, or uh, depend from cities or, you know, regions. So the ones that are national and that I uh, directly uh, dealt, um, managed by the government are about 30 to 40 of them. So for those museums, because of the law, they are public administrations, so they should open up their data. And if we're go back, going back to the uh, subject of the images, you know, at least the metadata. But the uh, Réunion des Musées Nationaux, the public operator, has a, this uh, particular status, which in front is an EPIC, which makes it not exactly an, a public administration, but a public-owned company. So these publicly-owned companies are outside of the scope of the law. So which means that the RMN does not have to open up its data, and its data is basically the National Museum's data. So if any museum you know, uh, wanted to open up their data, they, you know, would have. But the thing is, uh, and maybe, Kim, that's, you know, relates to some of the things you said about cities, that um, there is not much of a, 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 a culture of data, of APIs in the, um, you know, cultural sector. And again, it's not for everybody. In France, for instance, the National Library, the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale has this huge, extensive uh, culture of data. But, you know, most museums, although they do have databases and they do have, you know, IT systems and manage lots of things, I would not say they necessarily have a culture of data. And this does, might not, you know, mean that much to them. So I did not see a big thing happening, uh, although there are, you know, anyone who opens up data or opens up images for you know, in open data formats, gets lots of press, but it's always, you know, tiny examples that gets lots of press, but there's no real movement uh, very uh, deep. And what I believe now is that because these things took so many years to happen or do, do not really happen that much, uh, now the question is moving from, you know, opening up the data or opening up APIs to what other people could do with those, you know, algorithms and stuff. So I think that it's very urgent that this culture of data, you know, is more widely uh, spread. And I would say even among the populations, because, you know, our museum directors are also citizens and, you know, so the, I think there's really a matter of uh, being more aware of how data can be important, how can they help produce value, how can they help protect you, how can they help, you know, protect also um, uh, you know, if you, if you know what you want to do with your data, you can set out the rules, you can make them explicit on an API portal, on a website portal, whatever. But it means that you have thought about it, you have discussed it, you know where you're going. And from there, you can step for, further, you can have interesting partnerships with maybe the GAFA or any startup or whatever. But you need for this to uh, get, get into uh, this culture of uh, data. A new team on regulation. Do you see any country making regulation on cars or piece, uh, like manufacturers about openness? Do you see? Do you see it so far? Yeah, totally. So uh, again, um, countries, uh, for example, China. Okay, China is already the number one market for all the traditional cars, so ownership cars, including luxury luxurious cars like Ferrari, Maserati, Lamborghinis, okay? And we believe that China will be also the number one market for mobility as a service, okay? Also thanks to their flexibility, let's say flexibility in the, in the government. So basically, if they want to do something, they just do it. They don't care much about the opinions, right? Which is kind of a... Ideologically, for me, personally, is not like... I, w I was born and grew up in Europe, and so uh, it's kind of weird. But in terms of m innovation and massive adoption, actually, they are very, very cool, very fast also. And they are kind of choosing great things for the population, yeah in a weird way, but at least they are transparent, saying, hey, we are controlling you for everything you do. All the data belongs to us, right? 
And they are transparent and not to be transparent. Exactly. Yeah. At least they, they say, hey, guys, this is how we do things. But in Europe or USA, I don't think we have that. Uh, it's kind of, um, in a way, sometimes we are, I think like we are in a fake democracy. Sometimes we, we, we think that uh, should be every, everything transparent, but then in the end, we, it's not like this, okay? But um, I think that uh, the culture of data, okay, and APIs should be something that has to be extended to the population, to everyone, because everybody, we are generating a lot of data, okay? And this data is a very valuable thing. And now companies like Google or Amazon, they're getting this, extracting this value and not giving back to the users, in a way. So, what we are doing uh, with different countries, with different players in the world, we need to have a very flexible approach, so each one can choose their own policies on AI, data. But we believe also that with the, te the technology available today, such as blockchain and smart contract, we can even uh, think about to empower every single user, okay? Let's say that a user is taking a taxi or an Uber, is getting from A to B somehow, and he, this user is paying for this trip, okay, this ride. So data should belong to the, to, the, to the person that is paying, okay? So which is kind of an interesting scenario. But obviously, it's not easy to manage because there are many, many rides a day on Uber, Lyft, Didi. But technology now with smart contracts, blockchain for the data integrity, whatever, can manage this granularity. And when Google wants to buy a chunk of data from Paris, from a very specific time, let's say the, the data from 2017 in Paris, all the people that generated this, so multiple owners, they can get benefit in terms of money, maybe. Mm. So maybe Isabel, you know, we had this French congressman like Julien Dre, who, who for political reasons say that all the GAF, all the data the GAF are taking, right? Uh, okay, you can take all the data you want as long as you give 50,000 euros to every French citizen when he's 18, right? So it's a, uh, yeah, it's, we'll not comment on that, but. Uh, what Tin was saying also about China, you know, China has the, the, the biggest search engine, right? Baidu make more request uh, queries than, than Google, right? Uh, Tencent is bigger than Twitter, right? Alibaba is a lot bigger than Amazon, right? So China, because of regulations, right? So, of course, China is not an example on many, many things, right? But on this topic, right, uh, because of regulation, they, they made their own giants, right? Uh, they made their own giants, they protected their market, uh, so do you think, what do you think about Europe right now on regulations? And uh, yeah, what's, what's your vision about the topic? It's a hard one. No, uh, I, think that, um, I think that protectionism is not something that should be defended, you know, uh, basically. Because uh, I think, you know, globalized world and it's better to exchange and work all together on the same planet than just, you know, build, you know, strong front, uh, barriers. Uh, but I think that the person who's very good at talking about this is Sebastian Soriano, who I believe yeah. is uh, coming today. He's speaker at uh, 4, 4 p.m. Uh -huh. And uh, who really has very strong ideas of how to uh, regulate without putting barriers, but with, you know, by uh, forcing companies to have uh, interoperable data to basically uh, connect connect the data to the user so that people can get their data back and also connect one to each other and say, you know, if uh, Google has data uh, or maybe some uh, commercial company has data about my use of whatever and I want to change operator or, you know, a provider of a service, uh, I, it should be you know, made possible for me when I change contracts to make sure that all the data they have about me goes to the new one. So, you know, it's this sort of uh, interoperable uh, things that are maybe more important than just, uh, you know, law enforcing uh, very, uh, you know, uh, strong things. Dictatorial. Uh, 
And again, you know, in Europe, we work so much with the, you know, GAFA. I think it's more, you know, what things are like. And I think, again, it's, it's important that people are more aware of what they can do, of whenever they, you know, they um, sign a new contract, again, for a company or an authority with a, with a company or a partnership with a GAFA, you know that they are absolutely aware of what they put in that contract, what they get from it, and that maybe if they have uh, a more of this uh, culture, uh, they will be uh, stronger at negotiating. Um, again, if uh, you're a company with a, a lot of data, but you don't really have this culture, and you've got this amazing opportunity of having, I don't know, a partnership with Facebook, and you think that's great because I will have uh, more people knowing me and, you know, more uh, buzz on Facebook, whatever. If you don't have anything to put in the balance, basically you're at the mercy of, you know, being told what to do, and you'll be in that state where you are going to try and provide to Facebook what they're expecting from you. But if you've got this strong thing, you've got an API, you've got documentation, and they know exactly what data they can get at which condition, when you start negotiating, you're more than equal to them. At least you're stronger in the negotiation. So that's why I think that, again, it's very important that, you know, uh, and that's why it's very good that the API days today are more open on more political subject, not just, you know, how do I code my API so that it's really fast and secure, which is important too. And I think it's very important to have more people coming to these tech conferences and, and to start thinking of all this and start maybe, again, talking back when they come back to work with, the, you know, other people in the company and start really putting this on the table. And when they are doing their jobs and signing new contracts with service providers, really wonder who are we uh, signing with, who, at which conditions, are the data reversible, we, will the, we will get them at the end of the contract. Many companies sign with you know, IT contracts, and when the contract ends, they realize they don't have the data, they can't get them back very easily, or they can't get them back at all. Uh, we had this at the RMN with a contractor. We, when we started the API, we needed to get the data to build the API. And we knew we could not build the API on the uh, dam system we had. So we needed the data. And the company which had the dam and which contracted to us said, and it, they were sincere, they said, well, we cannot give you the data because then you will know the, the, the ar architecture of our database. And that's intellectual property. And you can't have it. So that was a big problem. That, that first step was six months to, 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 to deal with. And in the end, we got a dump of data with no documentation. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you, you could answer, oh, yeah, but if I give you the money you ask, you can understand my bank account address. So yeah, so you, you, if you don't get the data, you don't get the money, right? <laughs> so but uh, yeah, I get it. So Kin, what you see from the US, so China, uh, you know, regulation, uh, highly regular, dictatorially regulated market, right? Closed, but to, to favor inner, uh, uh, inner companies. Um, and, uh, and, and Europe, like PSD2, obliging, Banks to open APIs, but GDPR, like or RGPD in France, like uh, high, strong regulation on personal data. Like, what's your, what do you see overall on regulation, and what does it impact U.S. or not? Yeah, I'm starting to see some companies in the U.S. starting to mention PSD2 uh, from a banking, saying we're, you know, we're not, we're impacted by this because we have European customers, so we're being proactive. And hey, it's a good idea, so we're going to just do it. Uh, but that's pretty small. I'm seeing that with GDPR as well. But uh, pretty much in the U.S., we're still uh, high on our imperialist uh, Google, Facebook. Uh, we invaded the world. We successfully invaded the world with our technology out of Silicon Valley. And so I think we're still pretty high on having all your all your data you know and 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 the profits from that so i think we have a lot of lessons to learn honestly before we uh we uh will recover from that fully i think so coca-cola gums and mcdonald's and 50 years later google facebook exactly, Amazon. Yeah, exactly. This is the trend. Yeah. so i mean we're still thinking oh new markets you know even as i think some countries are starting to go uh, uh actually google stay out of our country we're not really interested um, but uh, we're still doing, uh, you know, looking at new markets and trying to, even, even as Russia 
uh, found some interesting ways into our country in the last year or two. Uh, we're still not really waking up to the to this. We just see it as an opportunity. So I think we've we've got some hard lessons coming up. Thank you. We yeah. have time for. I just wanted to yeah. add a little thing. Yeah, sorry. Um, between China and USA strategy, okay? Uh, let's say that um, AI and data right now are kind of a hot topic, okay? And uh, imagine uh, in our industry, especially when we think about self-driving, okay, Google is kind of leading right now with Waymo, okay? They, in a way, want to own data as much as possible, crunch this data to make a better algorithm uh, for self-driving, a better AI. Uh, the problem is that uh, now it's getting, the, it, it, it is a very hot topic and it's getting harder and harder every day. So basically Google will never go to China, okay? Because China, they don't want to have uh, Google AI mapping their cities, collecting data 24 seven, okay? everywhere in their streets, so also for security reason, this. So this is a very interesting scenario where uh, data is uh, ownership, policies, AI is getting more and more political, and also it's related to safety, uh, and um, every country ha every countries has the right to, to choose their own policies. Um, on so it. just in response to that, the, yeah. the Department of Interior, is, uh, it was federal government wide issued a mandate, no more usage of DJI drones for mapping national parks because DJI is as in China. It's a Shenzhen so, company. So these yeah, are the, I think the, company, the, yeah. the politics that are going back and forth on this issue yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh my God, a digital cold war. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, 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 not again. Not again. <laughs> the government realized last year that they were mapping all their nuclear facilities using DJI drones and all of our infrastructure. Uh, not very smart. <laughs> any question? We have an amazing panel, people coming from Asia, USA, from the Paris, really far. Any questions so far? Yeah, one question here. So, yeah. I have a question about regulation and open APIs and open data. How far should go regulation? Should just regulation say, okay, you have to open your data, you have to open your API, or should regulation go beyond that and say, you have to open them in a user-friendly way, and maybe you have to open them that specific way? Uh, my talk right before this on PSD2, so I'm going to be monitoring the banks for compliance with the stand PSD2 guidance, but I'm also raising the bar and going to be uh, monitoring them based upon my standards as API evangelists, watching organizations, uh, make sure they have support, make sure they have performance APIs, secure APIs. And so there's more than just having the technical interface and the, the regulatory compliance. So I think we need to have... Uh, at least guidance. I'm not a big fan. I mean, I'm, I am my American roots. I'm not a big fan of, of API regulation. I think uh, we should lead. Uh, industry should lead with, with forward thinking and, and self-regulation, but I think it should definitely be user-centric and really uh, uh, take care of everybody involved. But if companies aren't going to do it, and I don't see the U.S. doing it, I think regulation should be. Uh, um, a question regarding um, open data. They are really interesting to elevate uh, societies, but they are more used by companies today for their profit. Uh, do you think there will be not a political, but a, a social usage uh, in the future of this data, a really open one? Because population is not really tooled uh, as a company uh, to use them. Um, I think that's uh, a very good point, uh, and, and actually uh, you, we've seen sometimes that, although I was saying that sometimes in uh, some authorities uh, people are not really aware of you know, the importance of data, and sometimes the people who contribute more are, not, uh, are people from those authorities, but it's just people who are in middle management or you know, just sometimes you know, a single person, and they uh, make their organization 
uh, take part into very uh, useful citizen projects. Um, so, you know, it's very important, it's, it's important at all levels uh, that uh, uh, open data or open content, uh, generally, uh, it, it, it does work. I mean, lots of thi very good things are happening uh, with open uh, content, but it, it's not always coming from the top of the organization. Um, sorry, the question, you had a, another part of your question, I forgot it. Yeah, the question I think was more uh, today, bigger companies. Oh, get, yes. Yeah, yeah bigger uh, yeah. companies. Uh, yeah, that's one of the problems. Like, you know, when you open up data in uh, usable formats, uh, the big companies uh, jump on the occasion and, as you said, uh, you know, suck the data and make very uh, valuable use of it, valuable to them at least, and also uh, a lot to the users when it's uh, Google, because, you know, they issue very, very useful service and that's why we all use them. Uh, but they don't always comply by the rules by opening up in their turn the data you know, that they've used, because sometimes it's not open data, it can be Creative Commons, and they are supposed, if they use the data, they are supposed to put them back in the same license, and they never really do that. Um, so obviously it's, uh, it's quite complicated, and again, I think it's not by regulating more than you are going to solve this if you don't uh, uh, educate the population and people to use the, da the data better. But, you know, Google will always uh, be stronger than, you know, any a small group of citizens. But I, I think it's up to us to speak up. Uh, I don't know if the application was popular here because I think it was just in the US, but Google just did one where you could take a photo of yourself and it would find a painting that, or a piece of art that looked like you. And this is an example of extracting value rather than finding a piece of work and framing it and showing maybe where that piece of work may exist in your local area where you can go see it and supporting a museum it's totally extracting value from the museums and the art, art galleries rather than giving back in any way. And it's not that they're, uh, this is just in their DNA. It's not that they're, they're always trying to be malicious and it's the, you know, Google do no evil or do evil. What is their mission now? But uh, um, it's, we need to speak up. So when these, these products come out and these services, tweet at them, let them know, be vocal, speak up, and let them know that they should be supporting their local museum and giving back if they're going to be uh, using our catalogs and building tools around them. So last question here and final words uh, from one of you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, you. You kind of started to answer my question already, but um, regarding sustainability, so we've talked a, a little bit about, um, I guess, business sustainability, but if we look at... Um, the environment and uh, and the fight against climate change. I was wondering uh, if you could comment on um, how maybe open APIs could, I don't know, benefit um, um, the fight against climate change on a global level. That's a really hard question, so you will answer it. So I did not get the end of the question. So about climate change, how APIs can help at some point, uh, yeah, climate change, environmental impacts. And especially open data, I think. Uh, but I think that, uh, that so many uh, data visualizations, uh, you know, appear every day, and that are so sometimes scary, or, you know, uh, so it's. Uh, I think just opening up the data in the format where it can be reused and just visualize is the first amazing step, and that's rather well done, I think. I think it's a quite complex question, and uh, you. You have many ways to to contribute in a way. With, uh, in our case, I believe that uh, if our vehicles are going to be very adopted, okay, these are kind of uh, great tools to collect data that can be very valuable for uh, the climate change. Okay, also the environment in, in the city, for example, the air quality, okay? Um, and also, I think that it's not only about data that you collect, but also the integrity of these data. And because we saw, for example, big companies like Volkswagen Group, that they were cheating on emissions in the US, in Europe, everywhere. And it's not very cool. And uh, yeah, so, uh, it's very important to uh, control every aspect and uh, the complete traceability of the data uh, to also
to solve big problems like this. Or also for safety, for example, it can be collecting data of the environment. You can probably, uh, and through AP, uh, open APIs or smart contracts, that can, contract that can self-execute and autom uh, everything automated, probably we can have some cool technologies and cool companies that can come up with solutions to prevent big disasters like uh, fire in California, crazy, something like this. Uh, I saw some interesting project to reduce uh, and to find where uh, people are illegally cutting trees, okay, in South America, for example, by using a very cheap mobile phone that you can just put there, detecting sound. So you said, okay, someone is cutting in this area, so let's go there and catch them. You know, so this is very cool. With very cheap technology, you can do this, and it's. But the thing is that um, we also have to raise the awareness of uh, people about this and encourage people to find solutions. So, I will just. But with the technology, we can really, and with the technology available today, we can already do a lot of things. So, just I one hope. small example. So, Stream Data is one of, of the sponsor. But they made a study with green IT, right? About that streaming APIs in some cases can reduce up to 90% of the bandwidth, right? If you use streaming APIs and not poll APIs all the time, asking if something new is happening or stuff like that. So yeah, so maybe the answer is that we will use APIs and technology to generate value and margin to invest in in the uh, in environment. So I hope it will be that case, right? This is why we have this conference, sustainability, right? And uh, yeah, maybe one final words from each of you, like one sentence about like what's the main idea you want people to bring back uh, home and, and, and share with others? Maybe can you, you begin? Uh, yeah, I'll reinforce what you were saying about just, I mean, I'm an API evangelist. I believe in stories, educate people about the importance of data, go into these organizations, work on building data cultures and awareness about why this is important. Yeah. Can you share the mic? Yeah. And I would say again, uh, you know, your switch is you keep calm and use APIs. Is you know, it's keep calm and build an API, or at least you know whatever the culture is in your own organization where you work. Uh, maybe it's the maybe it's useless to talk about open data because it's quite you know scary to some people. Maybe it's not the way to go. But start doing any project that will involve people in a, anything about data, and you know that. One project can start, you know, uh, raise awareness, as you were saying, in an organization that would be a first good step. And if your organization is more uh, mature on the subject, then, you know, just build APIs and have fun and see what happens. And, yeah, the, let's say that the automotive industry is broken and um, pollution is so crazy. And we, let's say that uh, we really need to disrupt this industry. Uh, and um, so we would like to have more and more developers joining us, supporting us to make something better and uh, to save the planet, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That was a great, great panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very interesting.